Father in heaven, thank you for the church's firm foundation, Jesus Christ, the foundation we have in your word through the prophets and apostles, but Jesus Christ, our chief cornerstone. Thank you also, Father, that everything rests on him. Uh, Salvation is his work from beginning to end. There's uh, nothing that comes from us, nothing that commends us to you. And Father, as we go through a, a study in the book of Proverbs, it's, it's good to hold on to that, to know that you called us, you chose us, uh, you uh, justified us, you sanctified us, you are sanctified and sanctifying us and have glorified us in Christ Jesus. We're seated in the heavenly realms, but that you will also ultimately glorify us, you who began a good work in us will bring it to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. We thank you for that knowledge because Proverbs challenges us about our commitment to you. And so I pray that through the power of the Holy Spirit working in our hearts, through the inherent power of your um, word, that we would be challenged in the areas where we need to be challenged, uh, but that we would not hear Uh, that our salvation is up to us. Uh, Father, I pray for these um, favors. I ask that uh, we would hear exactly what you want us to hear today. And I pray it in the name of Jesus and for his glory. Amen. Uh, In my last ministry, one of my great pleasures was... uh, getting to be a chaplain most summers at our church's camp. And my favorite, my sweet spot, was junior boys, uh, uh, 10, 11, and 12-year-olds. And uh, they were just, you know, still fun, still imaginative, uh, but their minds could handle some complex things, and they weren't in those teenage years when they think everything's uncool if an adult came up with it. But I also love junior high. A little harder to teach because that was a mixed camp and there was the distraction of attraction. And so I had to teach a little harder, be a little more engaged. But at one junior high camp, early on, we had this young man who right away came up and told me that he had learning disabilities. And uh, if you wonder why a kid would tell me that, It's because we just handed out a booklet full of Bible verses to memorize. And we had said there's a prize attached to each one. Every day you can memorize a verse, quote it to your counselor, you'll get a prize. If you memorize them all, there's a really big prize at the end. And uh, most of the kids were energized by that challenge, but this one guy uh, just offered nothing but protestations. He said, it's not fair. Uh, I have learning disabilities. I can't memorize things. The doctor said I have concentration problems. It makes my memory bad. And that's how he understood it. And a lot of his discontent was focused on me because I was the chaplain. I came up with the idea. And uh, so he slouched through the first teaching sessions. And every time we talked about the verses, he'd furrow his brows and, and kind of pout. And the more encouragement I tried to give him, the more he uh, became somber, the more he protested. So I decided around him, I was just going to lay off this whole thing. I was just going to have fun with him. I attacked him in the canoes and fought with him in the water. And, and then one day I sat down with him at Handicraft, period, and I did the little popsicle stick project or whatever right with him and tried to help him. And uh, I had noticed that for the first few days of camp, he had one clothing choice, and that was a sports jersey. And so I asked him about it. I said, do you like sports? Yeah. What's your favorite? Basketball, he said, with just a, a spark of energy. Who's your favorite team? The Utah Jazz. I was in trouble already because I know nothing about basketball. And uh, this was back in the late 90s, so if he'd said the Chicago Bulls, I at least would have had something to contribute, because that's where we lived. But uh, thankfully, it wasn't about what I knew. 
I just started asking him questions. Yeah, who's your favorite player? Carl Malone. Uh, and with this, he kind of lifted up his jersey so I could, he said, this is his jersey. And he had the number 32 on his chest. I admitted to him that I didn't know much about basketball and just said, is he a good player? And he's like, are you kidding? The deliverer, the mailman, King Carl, he's awesome. Then he unloaded just a ream of statistics. He knew Malone's total points, his rebound average over years, his assists, his field goal average. I didn't even know they called them field goals in basketball. I thought that was only football. He knew how many three-pointers he'd made that year. Uh, he knew uh, what um, his uh, effectiveness was from the free throw line. Uh, honestly, my eyes, again, I'm not a real big sports fan. I would have just glazed over, except this kid was so energetic about what he was talking about. Well, uh, he paused after this big, long list of statistics. And i have been praying for an opportunity to get through to him. And all of a sudden, something dawned on me, and I really think it was the Holy Spirit showing me the moment. And I said, how tall is Malone? 6'9", 252 pounds, he spit out. He knew exactly how big he was. And so I just started asking him every personal question I could think about Malone, and he knew them all. And finally I said, I bet you don't know his shoe size. <sighs> he, it, like disbelief, like you asked me the easiest question in the world. It's size 18, he wears Converse. Well, I think what was happening at the moment finally dawned on him because he just got really quiet and stared at me. And I just smiled back at him and said, man, you have an awesome memory. And then just went back to working on my popsicle sticks or whatever we were doing. Well, he found me that night at campfire and asked if he could tell me the, th the three memory passages that he'd already missed. He'd already got them memorized that afternoon. And could he make them up? And could he get the prizes? And I said, sure. And by the end of camp period, it was a 10-day period, he had every Bible verse memorized and uh, got all the prizes. That kid had uh, a capacity for learning equal to or greater than anybody at the camp. It was just a matter of he had never directed his passion his energy. He'd never directed it toward anything besides basketball. I've never met a person who can't talk like an expert about something, whether it's the flowers in their yard or the birds in their yard. Uh, when the motivation is right, when the reward is attractive enough, when the fear is great enough, people become experts. They become sponges of knowledge about whatever the topic is. There are people who can sniff out the difference between a pinnet and a cabernet suavignon. You can tell it's not me. Now, I, I know, I know it's not pronounced that way. <laughs> but yeah, sauvignon. Um, yeah, that's not me, but there are people who can do that. Others can parse the economy and forecast cycles in the stock market and talk about cycles going back 200 years. One month a person will corner me and tell me all the nine benefits to my health of uh, coenzyme Q10 and then the next month they'll want to sign me up to be an essential oil salesman. I had a neighbor in Illinois who would find me working out in the yard and it was a problem because he never announced himself. He was kind of a a bachelor loner guy and he'd just walk up behind me and start talking in this really loud voice and it was always about sports. And he would talk for hours while I worked. He never got the idea that I didn't care because he had enough passion for sports for both of us and he knew everything. I've been amazed during these times at the number of people who have told me the micron size of the COVID-19 virion. I mean, that for a while, every week, I was hearing that size from somebody. We would never have known that, but we became experts. So what's your thing? 
What is it that you're driven to know about? Well, let's listen to God's Word. Chapter 2 of Proverbs, and I'm going to read the first five verses. My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding, and if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. I thought about starting this morning right in the middle of things with that verse, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Because if I started there with then, you would wonder when and how do we get there? Now, the fear of the Lord we've been talking about, especially, it's presented throughout the Bible, but especially in Proverbs, as a desirable thing. It's worth finding this kind of fear. The beginning of wisdom, it's called. And who doesn't want to be wise? The knowledge of the Holy One is understanding, we're told. We're all looking for understanding these days. So when we read, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. We should be engaged. We should wonder about how to get to that point. Did you catch the earnestness of the pursuit? My son, and I'm going to kind of nuance some of these words from what I looked up. My son, if you receive my words, if you take them to yourself, if you treasure up my commands within you, constantly turning your ear to wisdom and habitually applying your heart to understanding. If you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you desirously seek for it as for silver and hunt for it like hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Christianity these days is sold as easy. Following the Lord is just, you know, placing your trust in Him. That's true. That's the first step. But I don't hear a lot in preaching about a passionate pursuit and exertion towards the things of God. But every person in this room has the potential to possess a profound, life-shaping reverence for and knowledge of God. Every person has the potential to possess profound, life-shaping reverence for God and a knowledge of God. It's only a matter of the direction of your desire. If you don't have it, it's because you don't want it. Sounds harsh, but that's what I find in the Bible. If you don't have it, it's because you don't want it. Or, positively, you will have it to the depth you desire it. The book of Proverbs was written to take simple people and make them wise people. Wise in the Lord. Wise in His ways. And now in Jesus Christ, we have a better revelation than they did. We have more knowledge and more wisdom of God at our fingertips. There is no excuse for not growing in your faith except our excuses, (laughs) which don't hold water. I was a counselor at a different kind of camp when I was fresh out of high school, it was a Christian camp for cognitively impaired people. Most of them were already adults. Um, There was a camper there named David, and he was severely epileptic. I don't know what his other disabilities were, but he always wore a helmet because he might have a seizure at any time. Uh, He was sometimes very weak, so they always had a wheel. He could walk, but they had a wheelchair for him. He was on so much phenobarbital and dilantin, both medicines that my brother had taken for seizures, he had so much in him that I was amazed that he was ever conscious. Well, one day, one of our other counselors was feeling sick, so she went to lay down in the nurse's shack, and then they asked me, the the leaders asked me to take David and get him out of the sun, because he was sensitive to heat. So there I was, sitting in this dark 
little building with the sick girl and David. And she groaned, oh, I'm just dead. And I, I had looked over at David, he had his head on his chest, he looked totally out of it. But when she said, I'm just dead, out of the dark corner, David's voice boomed and he said, why are you dead? Jesus made me alive. And then he sat there smiling <laughs> and just chuckling to himself like he was the smartest guy in the room. And maybe he was. Another time, we were out in this big field at a barbecue pit and the storm blew up like they do in Kansas out of nowhere. And we had to herd all the kids under a picnic shelter because it started raining and most of them were frightened and crying and the counselors were busy trying to comfort them. And then I, I realized I, I don't see David. And so I look back at the fire pit and he's standing in the pouring rain with his hands up, grinning from ear to ear, going, <laughs> and uh, just enjoying uh, what God was doing at the moment. It was a, a lesson for me as a young man, not to judge people's ability to be connected to God cognitively. We all have aptitudes and impairments. Some people read, I'm a slow reader, so it's going to take me longer to get through God's Word than some of you. Um, we all have aptitudes and impairments, but there's nothing that can keep you from a profound, life-shaping reverence for God and a knowledge of God. Because knowing God is not about the measure of your intellect, it's about the direction of your heart. More than that, it's about who you're pursuing. Look back at our passage, verse 5, I'll start in 5 again. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom, and from His mouth come knowledge and understanding. The Lord gives wisdom. One of the reasons that I can commend wholeheartedly pursuing knowing God is because I believe in His faithfulness, not in your abilities. <laughs> I believe that if you pursue Him, you will find Him. The wisdom is there. God has made it available it, abundantly in supply. We all have a huge chunk, the chunk, uh, a revealed wisdom of God at our fingertips. It's only about turning to it. Solomon started out by saying, accept my words and store up my commands within you. But I'm convinced that he could make that commendation because what Solomon was speaking was the Word of God. That's what any Jew would have been saying to their sons. You know, Deuteronomy 6, talk about it when you walk in the way, put it on your doorpost, bind it on your arm, when you lay down, when you get up. Uh, he was sharing God's Word. That's why he could commend it to his son. And I think that plays out in the passage because the pursuit of his teachings leads to the fear of the Lord and the knowledge of God. So that's what he's passing on to his son. And Solomon knew better than any man alive that real wisdom comes from God. You know, I don't know how God gave wisdom to Solomon. Perhaps it, the initial wisdom was a kind of a direct divine download. Just like a... a hard drive dump into Solomon. I don't know how it worked. But if you read the works of Solomon, if you read like Ecclesiastes, and uh, there's evidence that Solomon was pursuing wisdom also. So I, I say that because I can't think of anywhere else in Scripture where it's presented like we're just going to get this divine wisdom beamed into our head with no effort on our part. Uh, maybe some of us get that idea from James. I used to think about James that way when he says, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives freely uh, or generously and without finding fa fault and he will receive it. I, I used to think, I don't know what to do here. I'm just going to pray and God's going to tell me. And I'm not ruling that out. God definitely gives us direct guidance through the Holy Spirit uh, in life, but 
even this passage from James is in the context of growing through the testing of your faith. So, let me read some challenging and relevant words from the Apostle Peter. God's divine power has given us everything we, lead, uh, everything we need for life and godliness. So, God's divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. If you stop there, again, it sounds like it just gets beamed into you when you come to Jesus Christ. But keep reading. He's given us everything through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these, He has given us His very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. So, we, we gain the life that God wants us to have through our knowledge of Jesus Christ, that's relational knowledge, but also intellectual knowledge uh, through the precious promises. That's how we become like Christ. And then it says, make every effort for this reason, because this is true, because God has supplied it for you to pursue, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because God supplies everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Christ, we make every effort to grow in what He's promised to supply. So that our knowledge, think of this, so that our knowledge of Christ will not be ineffective and unproductive. Evidently, that's a possibility in the Christian life. To know Jesus genuinely but to not have that knowledge work out and accomplish what it's supposed to in your life and, and through you in the life of others. Make every effort in the Greek is a very intense. It's employ all that you are. Exert everything that you have. And that's the kind of intensity Father Solomon was promoting when he said, take my words to yourself, treasure them up, Always be turning your ear to them, applying constantly your heart to understanding, calling out, crying out for knowledge, searching for it like it's treasure. There's some intensity in this pursuit. Wisdom is not portrayed in God's Word as a magic download, but rather a gift that we go after. Wisdom is pursuing God based on the promise that He will be found. What's your thing? And why do you pursue it? Because every human subject offers or promises something. Becoming a sommelier, uh, the, you know, the, the person who's an expert on wine, is going to give you an air of sophistication. It might get you entree into certain echelons of society. Becoming Alan Greenspan Jr. Are you all old enough to remember Alan Greenspan? Well, maybe, I don't know. We... He was the, the economist for years and years uh, in charge of the treasury all the time I was growing up. And, and if you get that kind of knowledge, you can build your portfolio and you'll get an audience among people interested in stocks and things like that. Diving into the deep end of uh, uh, researching health supplements might prolong your productive life at least and improve others. We invest our energy in subjects because we see potentials for gaining influence, personal safety, financial security, friends. Maybe it's more, uh, less about us. Maybe we see a way to leave the world a better place. Every subject promises something. I've got a friend on Facebook who is absolutely, he's always been kind of a beast, uh, physically. Uh, he has devoted his life to weightlifting. In three years, I have not seen 
a picture on his Facebook that was not in the gym. It, he just doesn't have a life other than that. And I've always been a little jealous of people who have that exercise gene. It has appeared periodically in my family tree, but it skipped me. Uh, you know, if, I, if there's a project to do where I have to work hard, I will work at it all day long. But go to the gym for the sake of the gym, that's not in my repertoire. And I wish it was, because I see in other people the benefits, or I see in myself the lack of benefits. But listen to this, 1 Timothy 4.8. Physical training is of some value, but godliness... Godliness is what Proverbs is aimed towards creating in a person. But godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. And for this we labor and strive that we have put our hope in the living God who is the Savior of all men. And then immediately Paul urges Timothy and those who and those with him to devote themselves, again, uh, a word about energy and focus, devote themselves to the public reading of Scripture, to the preaching and teaching of God's Word. So what do you pursue with expert intensity? Only the fear of the, no only the, fear of the Lord, the knowledge of God, will lead to value for this life and the life to come. So every person has the potential to possess a profound, life-shaping reverence for and knowledge of God. It's a matter of the direction of your desires. Why should we desire the fear of the Lord and the knowledge of God? That's what the book of Proverbs is about also. Verse 7 in this chapter begins to enumerate some of the reasons. He so God holds victory in store for the upright. He is a shield to those whose walk is blameless, for He guards the course of the just and protects the way of the faithful ones. And then verses two, uh, 12 through 22 adds uh, promises that the fear of the Lord will keep you from the way of wicked men and the way of wicked women. Remember, he's talking to his young son. And, and you can read those uh, the second half of the chapter in preparation for next week because I got this far in my ser sermon and figured I'm not going to have the, ch the opportunity to do them justice. And I wanted to leave you with one more promise. The Bible gives ample reasons for pursuing the fear of the no Lord and the knowledge of God. But what if you don't desire it? That could be a life-death problem. It could be because you, you don't know Jesus Christ and you have not had that desire uh, fanned into flame in your dead heart. But uh, what if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you don't feel the desire or don't feel it to the, in the sense that you believe you should? What if listening today helped you realize that you pursue all sorts of things with expert intensity, but that you're not motivated when it comes to the things of God. Well, if you have a sense of conviction right now that the direction of your desires are not what they should be, uh, I don't think that's me. I believe that's the Holy Spirit speaking through His Word. So how, should re how would you respond? Or how should you respond? By pursuing the fear of the Lord and the knowledge of God. With whatever impetus God is putting in your heart. Respond to the call with whatever you have. Now, that sounds like circular reasoning. Pursue what you want or what you don't want enough. Pursue it anyway. But look back at the passage. He's been saying, if you pursue these things, verse 9, then you will understand what is right and just and fair, every good path, for wisdom will enter your heart and knowledge will become pleasant to your soul. That 
part really jumped out to me. If you pursue these things, knowledge will become pleasant to your soul. If you're a follower of Jesus but realize that your priorities are not what they should be, listen to that again. If you pursue the fear of the Lord and the knowledge of God, wisdom will enter your heart and knowledge will become pleasant to your soul. The things you pursue, the things you prioritize become pleasant to your soul. You can probably think of that in some some other area that you've pursued. The more you pursue it, the more excited you get about it. You know, well, I can't say we all try to diet because some of you don't look like you've ever needed to diet, but it's a reality with me. And most of the diets that I have pursued have been avoidance diets. A better path is going after the good stuff until our appetites change. Eating what's good until our appetites change. And I believe God will do that with your spiritual appetite for Him. So let's pray about that. Father, I I do believe that and I know that. I know it from personal experience that when I'm in Your Word on a daily basis, when I'm pursuing the knowledge that You've made available through Your inspired Word, I, I flourish spiritually. And when I neglect it, I become anemic and weak. Your Son, Jesus Christ, thought this was so important that He prayed for His apostles and it also says... And he prayed for those, he was praying for those who would believe by their testimony. He prayed, Father, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Set your people apart for special use and good purposes through your truth, and your word is truth. So, Father, I believe every person in this room has the potential for a profound, life-shaping reverence for You and a knowledge of You. I pray that You would change the direction of our desires. And I ask it for Jesus' glory. And let all His people say, Amen.